Okay, um, so good afternoon everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm Simon Jupp, I work at the EBI. Um, I'm the project lead for the ontology services and semantic services in the sample screen and types and ontologies team. So I just want to give a quick overview really over some of the stuff that we're doing in the spot team around um, aligning EBI services with um, ontologies and I'll talk a little bit about um, the ad development of the RDF platform. So this is how I kind of see what we do in the spot team. Um, we kind of filter in, we suck in data from all the different resources at the EBI and we try and add value to those data. So we have um, curators who do cleanup um, and exploration of these data sets to try and sort of understand what, what's trying to be described in the, the metadata and we do a lot of ontology annotation and kind of restructuring of that data. So eventually, through this kind of pipeline, we hope that we can get some more structured, some more semantically, some more meaningful data out at the end. And um, there's a kind of cycle here that we do um, ontology mapping. So we try and map data to existing vocabularies and ontologies, and then we do ontology building. And, this kind of feeds back into a bit of a loop, so we can go back, we go and recurate data that's done before as we extend the ontologies and so on. So we think of these really as um, data enrichment services and what we're trying to build, and we have now funding from Elixir and a couple of projects, which is really building an interoperability toolkit. So this is a set of services that actually help you in this process of taking uh, raw data, raw metadata, and um, annotating it and describing it with ontologies. Um, so we have a bunch of services now. Um, it's a sort of quick overview. We've got things like the ontology lookup service. Uh, we've got a webular service. is a tool for creating ontologies and it has a plugin for Google Spreadsheets so we can start to build ontologies from spreadsheets. Uh, we've got our Zuma service which is a text to ontology kind of mapping service and it's, a, it's actually our main curation platform for where we try and capture all the curated knowledge. So all this work that the curators are doing from mapping data to ontologies, we store it in a central place and then we can actually learn from this repository about how to curate new unseen data based on what we've done in the past. Um, we work in a kind of technology agnostic space because we have to deal with the fact that um, a lot of the services at the EBI, a whole bunch of technologies are used. So we have to think about how we get all this structured ontology content back into the services and how they exploit those services in their in their own applications. So in say, you know, the search interface to Pride or Express or something. How can they make value of all this extra stuff that we're doing? <clears throat> so this is just the diagram again with the our main toolkits. Um, so our, on the ontology building side we have the ontologies themselves and some tooling that helps us build and extend these ontologies. And then on the data cleanup and mapping we've got the OLS service, Zuma, and I've got a new service that's coming out this year, um, as yet unnamed, internally we're calling it OXO, uh, but this is a service for mapping and cross-referencing uh, of ontologies. And this is a repository of curated mappings as well, so I think that's an important aspect of that. So where are we doing this? So this is not all the databases, but this is at least some of the resources um, where we're heavily focused on in terms of the uh, ontology markup. Uh, most of it is focused around experimental variables, so describing what an experiment's about and if there's samples associated, describing what those, those samples are. And an even more specific focus, I guess, on um, phenotype and disease mappings. Um, and we've got various projects around linking things like common to rare disease and linking uh, disease to phenotype ontologies. Um, and you can see here that <clears throat> of the data that we can map, um, you know, we're getting up to sort of complete coverage for some of these resources. So where, where we know that they've been mapped to an existing vocabulary, we can map those to the set of public open ontologies. So um, this is all obviously ongoing, but you'll recognize some of the resources here. Um, one project that's really driving this at the moment is, um, it was formerly called CTTV. This is the Open Targets project. Um, and this slide really just to give you an overview of the kind of vocabulary space that we're working in. So here we've got different resources, things like Reactome, we've got Uniprot, uh, the Variation Archive. Um, and these are the existing ontologies. So a lot of the data might already be mapped. So we have a lot of data that's mapped to OMIM, data that's mapped to MeSH, um, 
seeing more and more data that's coming in, clinical data where it's mapped to something like SNOMED or ICD. Um, so we're doing a lot of work basically doing the cross-references from these external um, medical vocabularies to um, what we would probably consider you know, true ontologies. So mapping these across to HP, um, ordo, mainly phenotype ontology and so on. And we have this kind of process where, you know, again, we, we're sort of pushing these data through our pipeline to clean it up, map to ontologies, validate, curate that data, um, push new terms to the appropriate ontology where required and repeat this process. Um, I want to mention experimental factor ontology. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, so this is what we call our kind of internal data-driven application ontology. So um, EFO is the ontology that basically shields us internally from the out ontologies out there in the wild. So you have all the kind of the OBO library ontologies where, that we use to annotate and curate the data. And what EFO really does is it brings these ontologies together in the sort of single consumable view so that we can have a unified view across these ontologies within applications at the EBI. So um, EFO will do things like make decisions about how it might bring in a term from HP um, that is classified as a disease, but uh, as a phenotype, but we might think that that's a disease. So we make some changes to these external ontologies so that we have a, a more coherent representation. Um, and it also allows us to kind of stabilize the ontology version so that we don't get too much reliance on external churn of these ontologies. So um, we're in this kind of situation now where we have to manage the evolution of the data in the ontologies. So on the right hand side we've got the data. This is you know, obviously a churn. Things are getting released you know, almost daily, monthly. And on this side we've got all the ontologies. These are also changing. And EFO, like I say, is this kind of our shield to those outside ontologies because it, it gives us a stable view across those ontologies. And in the middle is the kind of space where all the mappings live. So we've pulled out all these mappings. These live in our Zuma database where we capture all the provenance. So um, you know, where, where a particular ontology term is being used, in which data set, uh, who made the annotation, what kind of confidence they have, uh, and so forth. So we have this kind of three space where we have to deal with evolution of the data alongside the evolution of the ontologies. And then there's also kind of evolution of as the kind of the work that the curators do to change mappings. Um, and this is a difficult thing to manage, um, and we're trying to build tooling that help us, you know, update data sets when things change, when ontologies change, when terms get obsoleted. These have a knock-on consequence right down through all the applications at the EBI, so um, there's a real challenge there. Um, the good news is that with all this ontology annotation, you can actually start to see some value, so our users start to see some value, so um, we have applications now that do smarter searching through query expansion, which is driven by the ontology. Um, obviously, data analysis, so classically, classic things like um, Go Enrichment, but other types of analysis are now possible. Um, a whole bunch of data integration applications, so things like the Gene Expression Atlas and CTTV are examples where you know, we pull in lots of data and all that integration is done um, through the ontology annotation and the ontology work. And we've got some nice examples of visualization that's driven from the ontology. So we automatically generate this um, view of all the traits on the, for the GWAS catalog. Uh, and this, is, again, is sort of ontology driven. And you can filter down through traits by the, uh, based on the ontology annotation. Um, you can go and have a play with the new open target system. Um, so here it's really looking at um, associations between genes and diseases and, and drugs. And again, all this data is marked up with ontology, so this is a really rich resource, and you can we, we can start to do some quite nice visualizations and clustering of data using and exploiting the, the ontologies in there. Um, one other thing I want to mention is uh, the BioSolar project. So this is, you know, given that we've got all this ontology annotation, how do we enable the developers at the EBI to start making advantage of all this ontology annotation in their applications? So one area, key area, is improving search. Uh, we had this project for BioSolar, which is not really just about solar because it's actually, we've written a plugin for Elasticsearch as well. But essentially what it does is given a set of documents where you might have some ontology annotation in there, um, this plugin will automatically beef up those documents with extra ontology stuff. So it will suck in all the synonyms, the structure of the ontology, and you can then start to do some querying with things like hierarchical facets exploiting the structure of the ontology. 
Um, so this is the kind of thing that we're thinking about. This is what I mean about being technology agnostic. We have to look at the tools that people are using and think of how we can start to exploit this rich semantic content um, in the technology that people are using in different service teams. Um, and then finally, I want to talk about making it all fair. So, you know, ultimately, how do we expose all this data, um, all this rich semantic content to our users? And the RDF platform is, is one vehicle that we have for this. So um, some of you will hopefully be aware of the RDF platform. This has been running for about three years at the moment. Uh, I would still say it's still something that we're experimenting and piloting. Um, is that 10 minutes? Okay. Um, and this is the overview of all the data sets of the EBI. You can see that we're starting to get quite good coverage across the board of um, resources that we have available as RDF now. Um, so what, these are all, all the ones circled you can get in some form of RDF. And the good news, if you hadn't seen, is that the ensemble data set has now gone into production. And this was work that was actually done as part of a previous hackathon. Um, and I don't know if the animation's gone. So I can briefly go over some kind of lessons, I guess, from three years of running the RDF platform. I think that there has been some successes. Uh, it's definitely one place where you can do some novel queries over the EBI data that you can't do in any other way across those data sets. Um, we think that we're close to kind of production quality RDF for the data that we generate. That means that it's in the production release cycles of those databases when they do a new release and RDF data set becomes available. So it's not trying to make it less of a kind of secondary thing. Uh, there's a community of users. Um, uh, we have around 500 unique users on the site per month and can have anything between 10 to 50 million hits. So there's, there's usage. Um, big drive from industry. So a lot of the interest in the RDF platform comes from our industrial partners, pharmaceutical companies who want a way to take the EBI data set, all the EBI data sets wholesale. Uh, and the RDF platform is, is a good way for them to get access to all our data. And I think that it's also been a good catalyst for new RDF efforts. So we've seen a lot of citations for the paper where they can use the fact that the EBI is doing this to kind of show that you know, this is something that should be given some um, consideration. So some of the lessons. Um, so as we know, I think hosting public Sparkle endpoints is problematic. Um, they do go down, and we, we try our best to keep these up, but um, you know they, they get they can get hammered, and we have sort of problems on the back end sometimes with Virtuoso. Um, we had a model of federation, so we had separated services, and really the federated querying is not performant, uh, and, and it's a shame because that's that's I think where you can show the real value of having all this data, um, but we don't have the ability to show nice examples of how you can query across these data sets. Um, the inference support is limited, so we have all this semantic annotation, which is great for integration, but again, there's still a lot of queries we can't do, because we're, uh, but, but, but could be possible if we had um, uh, better support for reasoning over these data sets. Um, we know that it's not going to be scalable for all EBI data, so we've done some work to look at things like expo ex uh, exporting the variation data, uh, these real large archives of data, um, just simply dumping those databases out as RDF is not going to be a, a scalable model for us. Um, another challenge is just a lack of expertise. So it's hard in the service teams to get people um, who know how to maintain the RDF generation, how to update the virtuoso stores and so on. Um, and there's generally been a feeling amongst the service teams that there's, there's been quite a lot of overhead for these guys to get set up quickly with RDF. So they, they, they seem to take to other technologies a lot quicker than they take to this technology. Uh, and that, that's something that we need to be thinking about addressing. So I think the challenges for us going forward with RDF data. Um, so one is that for the resources at the EBI, much of it has already been pre-integrated according to the kind of relevant use cases. So um, it's, it's less of an in interesting sell to them when you say, okay, you can do all this integration because they've already done all the hard work because for most data sets of the EBI, you can get to everything already because they already invest a lot of effort in that kind of integration. Um, the RDF representation is not optimized for performance, and this means that building applications directly on top of the RDF platform is probably not a good idea because 
um, you know, the, the, the representation pulls da data apart and often when you're trying to optimize for performance you need to put important things close together to get um, faster querying. Um, and I think that there's a general feeling as well that you know, the kind of technology is not mature enough um, for some of our systems and the developer frameworks are really lacking. So you know, frameworks like Spring um, that are very popular for building web applications, the support for working with RDF and linked data in those kind of technologies is, is not there. Um, <clears throat> and I guess finally, yeah, we're still not at the stage where we can say that RDF is a core activity at EBI. And I think we have, these are some of the issues that we have to start addressing if it is going to become one. Um, so where are we going next? Um, so we're, we're looking at more virtualized infrastructure for RDF, so we want to make it simpler to deploy so that it's easier for you to deploy your own versions of our data um, and exporting, exploring cheaper paths to RDF. So like I said, this, this kind of ETL pipelines for generating RDF, um, they're not going to work. <clears throat> but we do want to publish data according to an RDF data model. So there's a whole range of things that we're looking at, um, kind of alternate approaches. So um, JSON-LD is an interesting one for us. We have a lot of REST APIs. Um, so can we get RDF from the existing REST data, uh, JSON data using JSON-LD markup? Um, Wikidata already mentioned, um, a lot of the EBI data is going into Wikidata. They're already doing RDF exports, so that might be a good way to get RDF from EBI data sort of indirectly via Wikidata. Um, something that Rafa will talk about a bit later is work on looking at things like RDFA and uh, schema.org and more lightweight mechanisms for embedding RDF in existing data. So that's all. Sorry, I'm just over time. Um, that's everyone in the team and some of the funding that we currently have. Uh, and with that, I'll thank you for listening and uh, look forward to sharing some nice Pendedin Welsh whiskey with you later. Thank you. <laughs>